Today's lecture covers descent with modification. Before the lecture begins, make sure that you've read the assigned chapter. And before the lecture begins, make sure you've created an outline by first looking through the PDF file of this lecture. During the lecture, minimize your distractions by turning off any TV or movies going on in the background, turn off any music, listen in a quiet space, and most importantly, turn off your phone. As you're taking notes of this lecture, be sure to do two things. First, do handwritten notes because studies demonstrate that you'll retain more information this way. Also, put the slides in your own words. This again maximizes your learning. All right, turn off all your devices and let's get started. Today, as we look at descent with modification, we're going to cover the Darwinian revolution, natural selection, as well as scientific evidence for evolution. As we introduce this idea of descent with modification, we want to understand that organisms exhibit a remarkable fit to the habitats in which they live. That is, they are well adapted to their world. For example, a frog is very good at living where frogs live. They have gas permeable skin that allows them to breathe in or out of the water, and they have strong legs and webbed feet, which make them strong swimmers. Some of the most visually striking examples of adaptation are examples of camouflage. In the image of the slide are the wings of the dead leaf moth, which show an incredible match to the leaves on the forest floor. The question though is how do adaptations like this arise? A new era of biology began with the work of Charles Darwin who in 1859 published On the Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection. In the origin, Darwin described a very simple yet astoundingly powerful mechanism of natural selection, which produces organisms well adapted to their world. Evolution describes both pattern and process. For example, it describes the process by which whales evolved from terrestrial mammals and it describes the history of those changes. Darwin was born in 1809. Charles' father, Robert, was an English doctor who was determined that Charles would also become a doctor. He sent Charles off to Scotland to study medicine, but Charles left after the first year. Charles was an avid outdoors person and loved collecting and trading rocks and insects. And given that love of nature, Robert agreed that Charles would be allowed to study theology. Before the discovery of evolution by natural selection, scholars looked to the wonders of the natural world in the effort to understand the mind of the creator. So theology was a great fit for studying nature. Darwin so impressed his professors at Cambridge that they nominated him for the position of ship's naturalist on the voyage of the Beagle. During the voyage of the Beagle, Darwin encountered many new habitats and species, and he witnessed firsthand the random patterns of biogeography. For example, why do llamas live in the deserts of South America, but not in North America, a place they could walk to? Why do armadillos only live in the Americas? And why do we only find fossils of armadillos where we find living armadillos? Yet anywhere Darwin went and in everything he saw, the overriding observation was the fit between organism and its environment. This is adaptation. Darwin was becoming convinced that species change over time and adaptation was a bigger part of understanding how species evolve from their environment. At this point, he did not quite yet understand how adaptation could occur. Here's an example of adaptation. Consider the three birds on the slide above. The insect eating finch has a pointy bill. Such a bill is good for catching bugs. The seed-eating finch has a robust bill that can apply great pressure to crack open the hard shell of seeds. And finally, the cactus finch bill is intermediate between these two extremes. In examples such as these, Darwin asked, were these three species once a single species? And if they were, how did their beaks become so well adapted to their roles on the Galapagos? These observations eventually led to our greater scientific understanding of natural selection. 
So let's look at natural selection. Natural selection is a process in which individuals with favorable inheritable traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. With this single idea, Darwin explained three broad observations about life. First, the unity of life. Why species are, in some ways, incredibly similar. The second, why adaptation occurs. That is, why species appear to have been designed for the lives that they live. And finally, the diversity of life. Why so many differences among species arise. Darwin's view was that species were like branches of a tree. The twigs are all different, though they may split off the same branch. The branches are all different, though they may split off the same limb. The limbs are all different, though they may split off the same trunk. In this view, life evolved from non-life, and we are all connected to a shared evolutionary history. Elephants are huge terrestrial herbivores with long trunks and big ears. In the pre-Darwinian view of life, it was simply accepted that the creator gave these traits to these creatures independently. In Darwin's view, elephants share these characteristics because they inherited them from a common ancestor which also had these characteristics. Those characters are not exactly the same in the three living species of elephants because they diverged as each species adapted to local conditions. The concept of evolution by natural selection is as simple as it is powerful. By way of reminder, natural selection is a process in which individuals with favorable inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. Natural selection is based on two observations and generates two inferences about the world. The first observation is that individuals vary in phenotype, where you recall that phenotype describes any measurable thing about an individual. The ladybugs in the pictures are all the same species, but nevertheless, they vary substantially in terms of color, number, size of spots, body size, etc. Having said that, individuals do not vary chaotically. Offspring tend to resemble their parents. Thus, phenotypic variance is heritable. And the second observation is that all species produce many more young than can possibly survive. We'll return to this section later. But the simple fact is that all species have the capacity to exhibit exponential growth. And that means in most populations, there is a struggle for existence. As a consequence of the two observations we just mentioned, there are two inferences. The first is, as an individual varies, if some variants are more suited to the environment than others, they will tend to live longer and leave more offspring behind than the lesser adapted variant. This is natural selection. Over time, specifically over generations, natural selection results in adaptation. The picture on the screen are two species of a praying mantis, both of which are well camouflaged. Each of these praying mantis are the results of generations of selection for pinker and pinker, shown on the left, or greener and greener bodies, shown on the right. The differences between the two species are the results of differing selection pressures on the different plants or parts of the plant. The similarities in the overall structure of the praying mantis are due to the fact that prior to their divergence, these two species share the vast majority of their evolutionary history. So when you study natural selection, you need to keep in mind that while individuals change over their lifetime, that sort of change is developmental, not evolutionary. Individuals live or die. Groups of individuals evolve. Natural selection can favor some variants over others but it cannot create such variations.
Different selection pressures will act in different habitats. Yellow spiders will be favored on yellow flowers. Pink spiders would be favored on a pink flower, etc., etc. So now we've covered the Darwinian revolution as well as some of the basics for natural selection. Next, let's consider the scientific evidence for evolution. As we consider evidence for evolution, we can look at direct observations. Example of direct observation is MRSA. The bacterium Staphylococcus aureus is commonly found on people's skins or in their nasal passages. The chromosome map of Staph aureus clone USA 300 is on the screen in the figure on the left. Aureus became resistant to penicillin in 1945. This was two years after penicillin was widely used for infections. Aureus then became resistant to methicillin in 1961. This is again about two years after it was first widely used. Methicillin resistant aureus strains are dangerous pathogens. Methicillin works by inhibiting a protein used by bacteria in their cell walls. MRSA bacteria use a different protein, a different enzyme in their cell walls that is not affected by methicillin. When exposed to methicillin, MRSA strains are more likely to survive and reproduce than non-resistant aureus strains. MRSA strains are now resistant to many antibiotics. This is the evolution over time of Staphylococcus aureus and its resistance first to penicillin and then to methicillin. This resistance demonstrates observational evidence for evolution. Next, let's look at homology as a piece of scientific evidence for evolution. Evolution is a process of descent with modification. Related species can have characteristics with underlying similarity that function differently. Homology is similarity resulting from common ancestry. Once homologous characters have been identified, they can be used to infer phylogeny. A shared ancestral character is a character that originated in an ancestor of the taxon. A shared derived character is an evolutionary novelty unique to a particular clade, and a clade is a group of species that includes an ancestral species and all its descendants. A character can be both ancestral and derived depending on the context. Examples of homologies at the molecular level are genes shared among organisms inherited from a common ancestor. Homologous genes can be found in organisms as dissimilar as humans and bacteria. Many organisms have retained genes, like vestigial structures, which have lost their original function. Analogous structures or molecular sequences that evolved independently are also called homeoplasies. Homologous structures that are anatomical resemblance represent variation on a structural theme present in a common ancestor. Even though they have become adapted for different functions, the forelimbs of all mammals are constructed from the same basic skeletal elements. One large bone attached to two smaller bones, attached to several small bones, attached to several metacarpals, attached to approximately five digits, in each one of which is composed of multiple phalanges. The arm of the human, the foreleg of a cat, the flipper of a whale, and the wing of a bat are superficially very different anatomical structures. But if we look beyond the surface and talk about that bone structure in the same arrangement, we see a lot of homology. It's very important to note that the bat and bird wings are homologous as forelimbs, but they're analogous as functional wings. We share these bones by descent, thus they are homologous characters. The more complex two similar structures are, the more likely it is that they are homologous.
The fossil record is also scientific evidence for evolution. A fossil is the preserved remains of a dead organism from millions of years ago. Fossils are found in rocks and can be formed from hard body parts such as bones and shells which do not decay easily and are replaced by minerals as they decay. Parts of organisms that have not decayed, dead animals and plants can also be preserved in amber, peat, tar, or on ice. And preserved traces of organisms such as footprints or burrows or rootlets can become covered by layers of sediment which eventually become rock. The fossil record provides evidence of the extinction of species, the origin of new groups, changes within groups over time. Fossils can document important transitions, for example, the transition from land to sea. Fossil remains have been found in rocks of all ages. Fossils of the simplest organisms are found in the oldest rocks and fossils of more complex organisms in the newest rocks. This supports Darwin's theory of evolution, which states that simple life forms gradually evolved into more complex life. Evidence for early forms of life comes from fossils. By studying these fossils, scientists can learn how much or how little organisms have changed as life developed on Earth. And finally, we're going to look at biogeography. Biogeography is the scientific study of the geographic distribution of species, and this provides evidence of evolution. Earth's continents were formerly a single large continent called Pangaea, but have since separated by continental drift. An understanding of continent movement and modern distribution of species allows us to predict when and where different groups evolved. So now we're going to review some of the ideas that were covered in this lecture. By studying the fossil record and comparing anatomical, developmental, and molecular information of organisms, we can see that life on Earth has evolved. Charles Darwin proposed natural selection as a mechanism for evolution. Evolution is a change in the heritable characteristics of a population from one generation to the next. Darwin used the phrase descent with modification to describe the unity of life, that all organisms are descended from ancestral organisms. Proposed in the early 1800s, evolution was controversial because scientists could neither explain nor show a mechanism that resulted in evolution. That is, until Charles Darwin introduced his hypothesis of natural selection. Charles Darwin was a naturalist in England, who also raised pigeons as a hobby. He was amazed at the physical varieties breeders produced by selecting for desired traits. In 1835, Darwin was hired as a naturalist aboard the HMS Beagle, a mapping ship that sailed around the world, making various stops, including a stop at the Galapagos Islands located west of Ecuador. While surveying the islands, Darwin collected samples of plants and animals, including a variety of birds that he believed were of very different species. Upon his return to England, a colleague identified many of the birds as being members of a group of closely related species of finches. Darwin had collected 12 of 14 different species of finches that inhabit the Galapagos Islands. Based on the identification of these 12 species and observations from other destinations along the way, Darwin developed a hypothesis that the Galapagos finches may have all originated from a common ancestral group of finches with the unique conditions on each island selecting for adaptations in finch populations. According to his hypothesis, a flock of ancestral finches flew to the Galapagos Islands from nearby Ecuador thousands of years ago. The islands are isolated from the South American mainland by 600 miles of open ocean and have different environmental resources, including food. The original colonizing population for each island exhibited variation in beak size and shape and the islands varied in their food supply.
Some islands contained mainly small seeds, others mainly larger, harder seeds, and still others had large insect populations. Finches with larger beaks could crack the larger, harder seeds, but had trouble collecting the smaller, delicate seeds. Finches with smaller beaks could pick up smaller seeds, but had trouble cracking larger seeds. On islands where the dominant food supply was larger, harder seeds, Darwin observed that finches with larger beaks were more prevalent. On islands where smaller seeds dominated the food supply, finches with smaller beaks were more prevalent. Darwin hypothesized that the food supply influenced the characteristics of the bird populations. The birds that are able to gather seeds most effectively are more likely to survive and reproduce, passing their traits to the next generation. This reproductive success is referred to as fitness. Birds that can't feed on the food supply as effectively are less likely to survive and reproduce. Over time, the favorable beak shapes become more common in the population. Darwin connected his observations of finches on the Galapagos Islands with the pigeon breeders in England selecting and breeding birds for specific traits. However, in this case, the environmental conditions selected for specific traits. Traits or adaptations that increase an individual's chance to survive and reproduce are more often passed to the next generation. Their offspring would exhibit those similar traits. Over time, the population would change. He called this process natural selection. Although Darwin could not have known this, the size and shape of a finch's beak is determined by multiple genes inherited from the parents. Mutations in the genes lead to new alleles, which are versions of a gene. These different alleles influence the size and shape of the finch's beaks. These alleles can be passed from parent to offspring. Offspring that receive the small beak alleles tend to have smaller beaks. Those receiving the large beak alleles will tend to have larger beaks. Because the beak size and shape are influenced by multiple genes with multiple alleles, there can be a large amount of genetic variation in a population, which can lead to various phenotypes. Natural selection acts on phenotypic variation. In a small population, allele frequencies can change rapidly due to natural selection. As descendants of the ancestral finches migrated to adjacent islands, they carried their alleles for beak size and other characteristics. The environmental conditions, including the food sources on each island, influenced the reproductive success of the birds, such that over time the population changed. After many changes accumulated in a population, it gave rise to a separate species. In the case of the Galapagos finches, the process of speciation occurred many times, producing the 14 species of finches currently found on the Galapagos Islands. In a similar way, natural selection has helped shape the evolution of many different species all over the world. Darwin relied on the scientific tools at his disposal, the fossil record and anatomical, developmental, and environmental observations to formulate his hypothesis. It is significant to note that molecular studies have yielded further support to the theory of evolution by natural selection. All right, so today's lecture covered descent with modification. We looked at the Darwinian revolution, natural selection, and scientific evidence for evolution. As you finish up your notes from this lecture, combine them with the notes that you took while you were reading the textbook. As you've looked over those notes, you can prepare for the quiz and for the test on this material by using the assisted reading questions, the questions at the end of the chapter, and the questions at the end of each chapter section. If you have questions remaining about this material, please reach out to your professor through email or office hours or bringing your questions to class. Additionally, you can talk to your learning assistant who is assigned to this course.